Well, we're going to be looking at Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13 today. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, and I call this message, Contending for Repentance, Rendering Our Heart. Yes, it's uh, going to be one of those sermons today. Uh, I was praying, uh, when I found out that Jody needed me to come up here, we were really praying on what was going to be the message. And uh, this wasn't something we thought of you know, beforehand, this was something God just laid on my heart on Friday. And really, it's, it's contending for not our presuppositions of repentance, where we think of, I think, when I think of repentance, a lot of times I think of the guy on the street corner with the, the turn or burn type of mentality, but really how repentance is a gift. It is, a, it is something we should cherish, something we should look forward to doing. Even though it's going to be a challenge and it's hard to do, it is still a joy to do so. And that's what we're going to look at today. And I'm going to show you how, how that principle is taught here in, the, in, in Joel. So follow along with me, will you? Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. It says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. So the first thing I want to look at is the heart. The heart, it's, it's, a, t- it's a term that we still use today. You know, you say in marriage, you know, you, you're going to give each other your hearts. But in, in the Bible sense, we're going we're to look at what it means when the Bible talks about heart, because everything we're building is based off of that. When it says, return to me with all your heart, when it says, rend your heart, not your garments, what is God saying? What is he speaking and the definition that I, I, I really like around what the heart is, is that it's the center of focus of man's inner personal life. The heart is the source of motives, the seat of the passions, the center of the thought process. Let me read that again. It is the center of focus of man's inner personal life. The heart is the source of motives, the seat of the passions, the center of the thought process. So when, when, the, when the Bible te- talk, uh, teaches about taking your heart or giving your heart, what he's saying is, is, what do you love? What do you want? And what are your motives? And he wants that. He wants what you want, and he wants what you love. So when we say give your heart to the Lord, we're talking about give everything, you, your desires, your inner personal life, the center of your thought process, your passions. He wants all of it. And you can do your heart either in, in by, you can kind of build your heart by yourself or under the Lord's control. We see in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, that the heart is where the trust comes from in God. This is a very popular passage. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make, he, he will make your path straight. So if that's the case, then we can also do the antithesis of that. We can also not trust in the Lord with all our heart, and we can only lean in our understanding. In the same way, we can not submit to him. In the same way, we can we cannot realize that his paths make it straight, where we enjoy the curves and the roller coasters. So often I'll be talking with somebody, and, and they're, they're trying to, to do it with their own power. They're trying to navigate the waters of this world by their own powers, and they just don't understand the, the beauty and the, the awesomeness in letting God have your heart. Let him have your passions. Let him have your motives. Let him have your, your thought process. Let him have everything that you are so that he can give you an understanding, so he can give you the straight paths. It is also the heart where most evil intentions spring. Jeremiah 17, 9 is a good example. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I love the next passage, Jeremiah talks about how the Lord understands it. So Jeremiah is talking to us, he says, how can you understand your heart? There's so much wickedness that springs up from that. Jesus himself even says that from the heart comes all the evilness. From the heart goes out to the tongue and everything springs from that. And so we see two worlds clashing together. The things of our flesh, of our heart, the things that that our bodies want, that our, our, our worldly minds want and the things that God wants. We see it in Romans, the law of sin and grace, and it is 
a constant battle. You know, we're talking about contending for the presence of God. We, have to, we must always contend to turn to God. We must always contend because our heart is the battlefield. That's where the war is being fought. So unless understood through the word of God, the heart is a most wicked place. The heart is the most wicked place. Your deepest desires, motivations, and thoughts all originate in what, called, what the Bible calls the heart. This will either be a place of wickedness or it will be a place where God rules. Would you rather live in a life where, where your heart is ran by the flesh or is ran by the Lord? It all starts with the heart. So when we're going to be talking about the heart, we're talking about the passions, the motives, the thought processes, that, that, it's, that it's a wicked place that needs to be renewed. So let's look at that. Let me break up this passage. We're going to look at verse, chapter, or verse 12 first, then we'll dive into verse 13. Where I really want to camp in verse 12 is where it says, Return to me with all your heart. Return to me with all your heart. You know, God doesn't settle for anything but total domination of your heart. You never see a passage in the Bible where it says, give me a piece of your heart. The term is always, give me all of your heart. Give me all of what you are. Give me all of your thoughts. Give me all of your love. Give me all of your passions. Give me all of your motives. Because he wants a loving relationship with you. This is what makes our God different than any other false gods that have ever existed in the history of man, the ones that we have created, because our God is one of a loving relationship. Imagine this. Amy and I get married, and for her, she goes, Kelly, I'm going to give you all of my heart. And, in, and in what I do in response to that is say, well, I'm going to say that I will, but I'm going to only be married to you on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Do you think that will crush her? If Monday morning I wake up and go, you know what, I'm going to go stay at, that, my, I'm going to stay at the house with this other lady that I met at work the other day. She would go, I thought you were supposed to give me all your heart. Right? And so we see this loving relationship that God wants with us, but so often we only give him parts of our heart. Give him pieces of the heart. Give him the areas where we feel, yeah, this is pretty bad. I need to clean that up, God, but there's other things I'm just not ready to give to you yet. Right? But Jesus is after all of your heart. For Israel, we see this, uh, a huge example for Israel says, and you can kind of see him thinking this way. It says, thanks for saving us from captivity, God. Their big thing was the, the coming out of Babylon. This is what Joel is speaking. He's speaking post-captivity. So he's thinking, oh man, Israel's like, yay, we're no longer captives in Babylon. This is great. But then we see a returning back to the ways of old. We see a returning back to the ways of the world. So he says, you know, thanks for getting us out of captivity, God, but now we got this. You did what you did, now we're going to take care of ourselves. We do the same thing. We say, oh, thanks for the cross, Lord. That was great, but we got it from here. I'm going to clean myself up. He wants all of our hearts so that he can renew our hearts. So as human beings, we are built to have a relationship with God, and he has made a way to seal that relationship by our hearts. Are you guys following this? So I want to camp in return. Return to me with all your heart. And returning equals repenting. And repenting is a very religious word, but returning is a really good way to define repenting. And the same word there for return in this book, in the, in the passage in Joel, is the same word that we would use for repent. And what it just means is to turn back away from or toward. Turn back away from or toward. It is not a negative thing, although the sin is. What God is saying here is not a negative plus a negative. He's saying, man, I want to correct you. I want to correct you because I love you. And, and so often we just don't like to be corrected, do we? There are many times when someone wants to correct me, and I'm just like, oh, I really don't want to hear this right now. I haven't had my coffee yet. Give me a few minutes. I'm not ready for this. And it really comes down to pride. 
The biggest, uh, really all of sin can be can combined into one word and call it pride. It's a heart issue. And it's what stops us from returning to the Lord because we want to say, you know what, God? I really feel like my way is the right way here. Even though it seems so silly when you realize who God is, but when you're doing it, it seems a lot, it just seems right, doesn't it? Oh, you know, God, in my logic, I really feel like this is the way to do this. I know your way is, is probably the better way, but even, in, even when we say that, we're still, our hearts are away from him. Even when our lip service says, God, you're, I'm going to give you everything I have, yeah, but I really want to go do this today. I've done that many, many times. But when we realize that returning and repenting, when we contend for that, when we, when we seek after, when we look forward to, the, to being turned toward God, we see it as a gift. Look at Psalm 80, verse 3. It says, restore. It's a derivative of the word repent that is used there in Hebrew. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Restore us, O God. And that's what it is when we return to God. What Joel is saying here is return Israel to be restored by God. Make your face shine upon us. It says, man, I, I want you to look at me, Lord. I want everything that you have to just stare me right in the face that we might be saved. Without repenting, there is no saving. Without repenting, there is no saving. Look what Jesus taught. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus says, The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. And he's not, he's not saying it like those street preachers, right? The repent. He's saying, oh, Return to me. Return to me so you can believe. Because the good news is only good news when you know the bad news. You must understand the wickedness of the heart so that it can be acknowledged and given to him and then destroyed. That's why it's a gift. Because when we cry out to God, he hears us. His promise is that he'll be there for us. Let me tell you, I don't know if many of you know my story. Uh, some of you might. But I was raised a pastor's kid, which either makes us really good or really bad. And I was more on the bad spectrum. But I was able to say all the right things on the good side. So I was what they called a Sunday Christian. And I would come in and I would say all the right things. I knew all the right words to say. I knew, I knew of God. I had a relationship with him when I was younger. I got saved at a, it was a Billy Graham revival slash rodeo in Moab. <laughs> you know, you could go mutton busted and then give your heart to the Lord a little later. <laughs> what a time to be alive. So I remember that moment very well. I remember going down, and if you've ever been to those Billy Graham things, they have the big you know, with calling over and goes forward, and I remember a little eight-year-old me, and it was a three-day thing, and I remember the first couple of days, I could feel the tug, and I was like, no, nah, I'm too nervous, and that third day, I was like, I'm going. I remember just thinking about it all day, like, today's the day, I'm going, I'm going to walk down there. I remember my kindergarten teacher uh, was a Christian, and I, mean, I was eight, so I was a few years past that, but she was able to pray with me, and it was such a cool thing to be able to, to go to her later in life and, and tell her how I remembered that experience. But then I grew up. I grew up in the church, and then the world seemed so mysterious to me. You know, I, w I grew up at very sheltered as a, as a pastor's kid. My parents did a great job of, of keeping a lot of the wickedness away and kind of and showing me what was good and bad. But when I went to school, I just thought, boy, I'm, ex I'm ready to get into the world. I'm w what is this world all about that we, that we preach against, that we talk about? And boy, I embraced the world as, as any college kid would. I didn't care about God. I cared nothing about what he wanted. I remember even talking to a girl once who I liked and saying, you know, I don't believe in God, so it's okay, whatever we do. And I remember just living completely, utterly for the world. Whatever the world had to offer, man, I was, I was in it. It was pride. It was whatever I do to get ahead. It was... Um, whatever I needed to do and whatever I had to say to get the, get the girl I liked. And boy, my heart was, was a wicked place. And 
It was actually when, I remember walking through those doors actually, still in that stage. I, had, I was engaged prior before, and I had, we had just broken up because it was, you know, God was working, and it was a very, I was spared from a lot of things. But I walked through those doors, I sat in the back of the church here, I got invited to some events, like I think it was a Blueprint back then, and that's where God did his work. He brought me back into community. And I, that was at that moment, I remembered, boy, I miss this. Because when I was in the world, I was so isolated and alone. I was so isolated and alone, and I felt like, man, and I had it all together. I had the degrees, I had, I had the girl, I had the jobs, I thought I had everything that the world could offer, and boy, I was as dead as dead can be. But the Lord never abandoned me. The whole time I knew, boy, he was right there. He's like, remember that time? Remember that time when you were eight? And it was suppressed and suppressed and suppressed and suppressed and suppressed until all of a sudden I was around 21 and boom, it came out. And I remember thinking, wow, it was that that prodigal moment where you realize you're living in in a pigsty, where you realize, boy, everything I'm seeking is garbage and I'm eating garbage. For what? So I ran home. I ran home. I remember, man, I was, I was on fire. I was just, I don't, I know what the world is and I don't want it because I've been eating it for 10 years. I never wanted to look back. That return back, that return that through the weeping and, and the mourning. And I remember thinking, oh, the time that was wasted and all the people that I hurt, all the lives that I affected negatively, all the lies and deceit that I, that I told about myself to make myself seem better than I really was. All of that came crashing down on me in one minute. Just overpowering. It was that Isaiah, woe is me moment when you realize how good God is and how terrible you are. It's what sent me running home, realizing, boy, I had a father who was always there. It was that repenting, that the turning to the Lord with all your heart, that is the constant fight. It's that constant tension that I felt. And boy, I've been running for him ever since because that, man, it's garbage in the world, isn't it? God wants to clean you up, but that requires giving him your heart. You're not, it requires giving him all your heart, your passions, your motivations, your thoughts. It's all got to be his. He wants all of you. And that's, that's a beautiful thing because you realize how much sin has actually made you seem really gross. And he wants it. He wants all of it. He needs you to contend for him, for his presence, because in the presence of God, all of that shame, the guilt, all the burden is destroyed. So we contend with him always to remove the sins of the past. And repenting is an emotional experience because it is your heart. It is everything that you want, desire, passions, and and God has to change that completely. He has to take everything that which way you were going and do a course correction. A lot of times it it is just a quick second, boom. Other times it's a long journey in other areas. You look from Saul to Paul, man, that was pow, but then you see other ones where it's, it's a slow journey of ripping and tearing and moving. And that's where it leads me to rend your heart and not your garments. Rend your heart and not your garments. So here the prophet Joel gives us an indicator of religious repentance and true repentance. Religious repentance and true repentance. The tearing of your garments in Israel was the the public display of repenting. The public display of repenting. It was showing to the world, ah, I want to turn to you, God, by tearing my garments. It was a form of really religiosity. It was the whole, you know, take three three of these in the morning and you'll be fine type of formula. All you have to do is just just tear your garments. You'll be fine. That, That shows repentance and you'll be good. Matthew, or Jesus said this about this type of mentality. In Matthew 15, 8, he says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Because we can, 
we can publicly show our repentance. We can, we can say, God, you know, fix me up. Whatever, Lord. Just do what you got to do in me, right? I mean, times that we, we had trouble with addictions or things like that, and you, you, you say, God, I don't really want this anymore, but inside your heart's still saying, boy, I really don't want to let this go. I really don't want to let this go. God wants you to rend or literally tear open your heart to him. This is how we repent. This is what this means is to tear open your heart. God is asking you to surrender everything over to him. And that's what tearing open your heart is. It's a surrendering. It's a vulnerability. To, 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 to rend your heart means you're tearing it, you're breaking it open for what breaks his. We sing about that, don't we? I said it was a joy, and, and it is a joy to turn to God and return to him and repent. And it's a, it's a gift by grace given to us that we can call out to the Lord that he will be there but I didn't say it wouldn't hurt. I didn't say it wouldn't be hard. We are talking about a real relationship here, not religious facade. We're talking about a reality where you're going to have to do things when you're turning. They're not always comfortable. This may require lifestyle changes for some of us. We may be in situations right now where we have to change our entire lifestyle in order to turn because God is calling us to do so change of jobs. It may, it may require moving out of the place where you live. It may require being very uncomfortable for a while because God is doing a course correction. This may require tough conversations where you have to eat a lot of humble pie, where you have to get under the humility of what God has done and talk to people and have tough conversations about the things you have done. I remember, boy, I remember when, when I turned to the Lord, all I could think about was all the people that I had damaged and that I had hurt and that I had wronged. And boy, I, I, God said, you have to go to every single one of those people and tell them what happened. Try imagine going to your ex fiance and talking about the transformation God has done in your life and saying, oh, I'm apologizing for all of that. Fortunately, I have an awesome wife who was totally on board for me doing that. <laughs> but it was very, very difficult. Forgiving people who have wronged you and, and asking for forgiveness for the people you have wronged is a very difficult thing to do, and it requires the complete destruction of pride in your heart. It requires complete humility and submission to what God has. But the beautiful thing in that is that he restores relationships. He gives grace. He gives faith. And man, he, he will do amazing things through the course correction. It comes to the point now where I'm like, like, tell me if I've wronged you because I have no problem. Like, I'll find joy in admitting it that I was wrong. And that, boy, that, that, just, that just changes the way your workplaces are, doesn't it? When, when you do something wrong at work, and I've been known to make a few mistakes at work from time to time, it's no problem going and saying, man, I, I really dropped the ball. I'm really sorry. Do you forgive me? And to see people just go, wow, I can't believe you said that. Yeah. Totally. It opens up a lot of doors. And it all starts by surrendering it over to the Lord to turn from the evil of the heart and to gain a renewing of the heart. So lose your heart to the world and gain it by giving it to God because he will actually recreate it. He will give you a, a new heart, which is what we all need, amen? A new heart. Because when we rend our heart, when we tear it open, God is going to come and mend it. And what we see here in this passage, it says, For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. So in that teared open heart, the one that's been vulnerable and, and is now broken open for the world to see, God is going to fill it with grace and compassion and abounding love. That's the way he mends this torn heart back together is through that. He relents from sending calamity. Let me just start with that point now. If you at one time or another have given your life to Christ, like I did when I was eight and then I prodigaled out, but have decided to pursue the world, you were living like an Israelite, just like Joel did. I was living like an Israelite. 
I had known God. I had seen the miracles that he had done. I had witnessed the things that he had done in my heart, the transformation, and I still had turned from him. And now God is, is going to be slow in anger when, he's doing, when he is correcting you. It may not be right away, but God is going to call and he's going to warn. He's going to send people into your life to warn you what is happening, just like this one is. And he's going to take his time, but don't imagine for a minute he's not going to blow your life up to regain your heart because he blew mine up. He blew mine up so that he could have this again. So if you're turning into the world and the world is where you seek, it might take 10 years. But if you're the Lord's, he's not going to let you go. He will do something in your life to blow it up so that you have no other place to go but him. I'm a witness of that. And I'm also the witness of how he restores and empowers he relents from sending calamity when you rend your heart and you return to the Lord and tear your heart open for him to finally fill it with the love and compassion and the grace that we all seek. And then here's the beautiful thing. Again, in that tore open heart, that beat up heart, it's going to be replaced with something beautiful. He's going to replace it again with his grace, his compassion, and his abounding love. In fact, he gives us a new heart altogether. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He takes that deceitful, wicked heart and replaces it with his power with a brand new one. One that thinks like he does. One that has the motivations that he does. One that has the passions that he does. Well, you want to know what it's like to have a, a broken heart for the people? Find the heart of God for the people. Pray, God, I want to see people the way you see people. And you're going to have a broken heart for the ones who don't know you because you're, they're, just, they're living in the world going, man, there's, and you just think there's nothing there for you. There's nothing there for you. It's all in the Lord. Everything you seek, an identity, the meaning of life, everything is there. There is nothing the world can offer you. I'm only 30 years old, and I know that. It took me just a few years to realize the world is a big scam. The truth is in the Lord. So when you turn away, when you repent and return back to the Lord in a real way, not just lip service, and believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is in the Bible, God does something amazing. You know, this last week, it was a bit of a hard week for me. As you know, we, we've started some, some Bible studies down in Utah County for people who are coming out of drug addiction, and, and I mean, the, the need of it is just phenomenal. I, just, I cannot believe the amount of people who are, who are stuck in it down there. And recently, I got to, to pray with, and I met a, na a lady named Ellen, was her name, and she was still detoxing and, and coming out of, of addiction. And, and I sat down with her, and we, and we prayed, and I was able to share a word with her. And it was actually on contending, and, and, she, wants to, and she wanted it so bad. She's, you know, she had just gotten saved maybe a few weeks before, which was a huge, huge thing. And you could see the, the transformation in her life. And, and she wanted Jesus more than anything else in the world, even though she had just spent $1,000 on drugs. Like the day before, she was struggling, but she was getting this renewed heart. Well, then I found out last Tuesday that she had passed away just a few weeks ago. Her heart just stopped in the middle of the night. And I, would, and I remember thinking, I, I mean, I was heartbroken because I had just met her and, and to see this new Christian just so excited about the Lord. But at the same time, I was so thankful that I could see the, the transformation of her heart in just a matter of weeks. That she was no longer living in the world, even though she was struggling with what the world could offer still. God was doing something amazing. He did do something amazing. And now she's with him. The Lord she was contending for was the Lord that she is now with. 
He took her old heart of stone and wickedness. Even with her own mouth, she was saying how terrible the world had treated her. And it replaced her with the new heart, one that was born from him. It was a brand new heart. The, lady I was up, the, the two ladies I was with, she had known her for 17 years and just couldn't believe the transformation that had occurred in just a few weeks. This heart aligned with, with God's passion. It aligned with God's motives. It aligned with God's thoughts. She, she still struggled with sin. Sure, she still struggled with addiction. But you could see the, the transformation had already started to occur. The renewing of the heart was there. This is an act of God because of his grace, compassion, and abounding love. All of this, this grace, compassion, abounding love, you can see it all in the person of Jesus Christ. You can see it all with what happened. What, the cross used to be over there. Now it's over here. <laughs> you can see it all with what the cross signifies. The grace that God didn't have to, to save us but his willingness to come and die for us. For every single one of us, because he loved us so much. The compassion to, to be a Lord who, who is one of compassion. You read the Gospels, and Jesus is a very compassionate person. We have a very compassionate God that understands us, that understands our heart, that understands the wickedness, that, and wants to save us from it. All we, is, all we ask is, is, he asks is return to us, rend it, open it up so that he can fill it. And then the abounding love, you read about this all the time in the Bible, the abounding love. One of my favorite terms is the unfailing love, because his love does not fail, literally. He fills the brokenness with a deep, deep love that never fails. And we're so guarded by it because we've stuck our heart in the world so much that's failed us over and over and over again. And then we have a God that comes in and says, no, I will never fail you. You cry out to me, I will never abandon you. Even though it feels like it sometimes, in the time of persecution or, or trial or hardship, his promise is, no, 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 I will never fail you. Again, the cross will never fail us. What happened on the cross when Jesus died and rose from the dead on the third day, that is an unfailing love of God. Amen. That is a promise that will never lapse. He promised to never forsake us or leave us. But we can sure suppress him, and we can sure say, no, I don't want you to have this portion of my life, God. I don't know about you, but I am done with that. I'm done with that. Can you stand for me? I just want to take a moment and just open ourselves up to what the Lord is speaking to us. Because returning to the Lord is, is, is something we need to do from a rendered heart, from a heart that is broken. So I just want to pray that God will expose these areas in our lives, that he'll expose the areas where we're not willing to surrender, we're not willing to give him our hearts, because he wants, again, all of it, not just pieces of it. He wants all of it. So if you're one who wants to just give him all your heart right now, just raise your hands. And you want to give, you want to give him everything that you are, all your motives, your passions, your thoughts. Let's pray and give him everything. Lord, Expose the area in our lives that we're not giving it to you, or where their anxiety sits, where fear sits, where the world has dominated for far too long. And Lord, we surrender that to you. Lord, show us, break our hearts, Lord, for what breaks yours as we sing about so often, so that you can fill it with your abounding love, your compassion, and your grace from which all things flow. Lord, we don't want to leave here unchanged. We want to leave here with all of our heart in your hands. Everything we are. Lord, we fight for this. We contend for this. We contend for your presence to fall upon us so that we will know by the stricken heart what we need to give to you. 
Lord, we're thankful for what you have done and who you are as our God, the one who promises this unfailing love, something we can't even comprehend. We can't comprehend a love that never fails, that never leaves us nor forsakes us, only found in you. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.